Bodies from the Ash, Life and Death in Ancient Pompeii, by James M. Dean. Essential question. What do we know today about volcanoes that people in ancient times did not? August 24th and 25th, 79 CE. On August 24th, the last Tuesday that they would live in their town, the people of ancient Pompeii awoke to a typical hot summer's morning. Four days earlier, a series of small tremors had begun to shake the area, but people were not very concerned. The region had been subjected to so many earthquakes over the years that residents had grown accustomed to them. What they didn't know is that the region's frequent earthquakes had been caused by nearby Mount Vesuvius. Roman writers had commented on the mountain's strange appearance. One had compared it to Mount Etna, an active volcano in Sicily. A writer named Strabo even concluded that Vesuvius had once held craters of fire. But because Mount Vesuvius had been dormant or sleeping for more than 800 years, no one realized that it still had deadly power. What's more, no one understood that the region's frequent earthquakes were actually signs that Vesuvius was building up pressure and getting ready to erupt. That morning, Vesuvius provided a cleaner warning that an eruption was beginning. Between 9 and 10 o'clock, the volcano shot a small explosion of tiny ash particles into the air. To the residents of Pompeii, 10 miles southeast of the volcano, this may have felt like a minor earthquake but to the people living in the immediate vicinity of Vesuvius, it was terrifying. The ash streamed up and fell like fine mist on the eastern slope of Vesuvius. A woman named Rectina, who lived at the foot of the volcano, was so alarmed that she quickly sent a letter with a servant to Elder Pliny, the commander of the Roman naval fleet, stationed some 18 miles away, urging him to rescue her. People in Pompeii might have noticed the small cloud that morning and may have felt tremors, but they continued with their daily activities until early that afternoon. At one o'clock, 81 loaves of bread were baking in the ovens of Modestus Bakery and vendors were selling fruit and other products in Massalium or Marketplace. The priests in the Temple of Isis were preparing to eat an afternoon meal of eggs and fish. It was then that Vesuvius finally awoke with a massive explosion. This cloud blasted from Vesuvius during its last eruption in 1944. But the cloud from the 79 CE eruptions was much larger. Since 79 CE, Vesuvius erupted 30 times before becoming dormant again. An enormous pine tree shaped cloud of ash, pumice, and larger rock fragments blasted into the air. Within a half an hour, the cloud had risen over 10 miles high and winds had blown it toward the southeast in the direction of Pompeii. The cloud blocked the sun and turned the sky over Pompeii tonight. Then it began to release the delish of ash. Lightweight white pumice stones and some larger, heavier volcanic rocks on Pompeii. At the same time, earth tremors continued to shake the town. At first, most people would have taken shelter in their homes or other buildings, but as the volcanic fallout began to accumulate at the rate of 5 or 6 inches per hour and the pumice grew to an inch in size, 
many decide to escape, protecting themselves as best as they could from the falling stones. They headed down the narrow city streets, stepping on the accumulated fallout toward one of the city gates. Some people used pillows and blankets tied to their heads. Others shielded themselves with pens or even baskets. After reaching the gates, many took their coast road. Others tried to escape by sea, but the buoyant pumice floated in the water, filling the harbor and making a seagoing escape more difficult. During this time, some were killed on their way out of the city, hit by larger rocks falling from the eruption cloud. Left, as the fall of the continent, Pompeians made their way to one of the eight city gates, hoping to escape the deadly rain of Vesuvius. On the right, most Pompeii streets were narrow and paved with stone. They quickly filled with pumice and ash as the eruption progressed. By 5.30 that afternoon, two feet of ash and stones had accumulated in the streets, on roofs, and in open areas such as the courtyards of houses and gardens. In fact, so much pumice had built up on roofs that some buildings began to collapse especially when the loose pumice was shaken by strong earth tremors. Many pompions were crushed in their houses when the roofs caved in on them. As the evening progressed, the rainy pumice turned from white to gray and grew bigger, some pieces almost three inches in size. But midnight, first-story doors and windows were completely blocked by fallout. Anyone who had delayed escape would have had to use a second-floor window to reach the street and then walk atop five feet or more of collected stone and ash. Fires were burning on the slopes of Vesuvius. Lightning filled the sky around it and the eruption cloud had risen almost 20 miles high, but no one in Pompeii would have been able to see this. Analyze the text, style and tone. How does the author maintain a consistently informal style when describing the events of the eruption on pages 585 and 507? How is a formal style of writing different from a casual conversational style? At about 1 o'clock on the morning of August 25th, 12 hours after the first major explosion, the eruption shift to its second and dead layer phase. Vesuvius was losing its strength and its eruption cloud was beginning to weaken. As the cloud collapsed completely over the next seven hours, it would fall in six separate stages, each one producing a pyroclastic surge and flow. With each partial collapse, a surge of super hot gas and ash blew down the slopes of Vesuvius at speeds between 60 and 180 miles per hour and at temperatures ranging between 350 and 650 degrees Fahrenheit. Each surge larger than the last, each one spreading farther. The surge cloud destroyed everything in its path, leaving behind a layer of ash. This was quickly followed by a very rapid pyroclastic flow of volcanic debris that covered the area like a hot avalanche. The flow itself was not lava, that is, a melted rock that would have moved slowly and burned everything it touched. Rather, it was a mixture of rock fragments and gas that rolled over the ground at temperatures up to 
400 degrees Fahrenheit. These combinations of surge and flow is sometimes referred to as Nui Ardent or glowing cloud. It is the most deadly type of volcanic activity because of its high temperature and speed. The first and the second surges in the early morning hours did not reach as far as Pompeii, but they did destroy other towns closer to Vesuvius. At about 6.30, a third surge ended at the northern edge of Pompeii, destroying some of the walls surrounding the city and suffocating anyone who had taken shelter in any of the outlying buildings. Skeleton images were frequently found in floor mosaics, wall paintings, and even on drinking cups in Pompeii. Such designs served as a reminder that life was short. This calyx, a silver two-handled cup, was recovered by archaeologists from the ruins of Pompeii. By morning, nine feet of pumice and other volcanic debris had accumulated, but the estimated 2,000 people in and around Pompeii who had survived the night might have thought that they still had an opportunity to escape. By then, the rain of pumice had lessened so noticeably that many residents took to the streets, which were still darkened by the volcanic cloud. Trying to get out of town, many were carrying lanterns to help them see in the darkness. But they were cut down around 7.30, when a fourth surge engulfed the city and the area beyond it immediately killing everyone still alive, whether they were inside or out. Some 15 minutes later, a fifth surge exploded through. Both of these surges deposited a layer of hot ash and a larger amount of pyroclastic flow. Finally, at about 8 o'clock that morning, a final surge the largest and most violent shook the area as the reminder of the volcanic cloud collapsed, crushing the top stories of buildings, bricks, tiles, stones, and other debris were blown through the town. The last surge deposited two more feet of ash and debris on top of the town, but by then there was no one left alive to notice what had happened. When the eruption ended, Pompeii was covered with more than 12 feet of volcanic debris. Only the very tops of a few ruined buildings were visible. Most of the higher stories had been blown down during the pyroclastic surge. In the days that followed, residents who returned hoping to find their city would have been lost in an unfamiliar landscape. Valleys were filled in, new hills had grown, and the course of the nearby river Sarno had changed. Even Vesuvius had a new look. The volcano's cone-like top had collapsed, leaving a gaping crater. And everywhere they would have looked, the landscape was blanketed by a ghostly covering of ash. Analyze the text, analyze events. How is the eruption of Vesuvius introduced in the text? Give examples of how the author elaborates on these events through page 588. Rediscovering Pompeii. No one knows what happened to the residents of Pompeii who managed to escape, since no written record from any survivor of the town has ever been found. Some people may have left the area, others may have relocated to nearby towns unaffected by the tragedy. 
Some researchers believe that a few people returned and tunneled into the ruins trying to salvage what they could. Since tunnels have been found during excavations within the ruins, but no one tried to rebuild the city. By the 4th century CE, some 220 years after Vesuvius erupted, Pompeii's name no longer appeared on maps. Instead, the area was called Civitas. The volcanic ash that buried the town became fertile soil and farmers planted olive trees and grapevines there. Sometimes they would come across bricks and other building materials that poked out of the ground. On rare occasions, a farmer might even find a statue hidden in the undergrowth. In 1594, an attempt to build an underground canal brought workers tantalizingly close to the ancient city. They found pieces of marble, parts of painted walls and statues, but no one realized that the discoveries might lead to the site of the Long Bird Town. In 1865, the artist Edward Sain painted an imaginary version of the excavations at Pompeii. In reality, slaves and convicts were often used to excavate the ruins during the early years that it was explored. This model depicts the theater in Herculaneum before early excavators looking for treasury plundered it. Pompeii and its secrets remained hidden for centuries. It was only after the town of Herculaneum, which was also buried by Vesuvius in 79 CE, was discovered that excavators began digging for Pompeii. In 1709, a group of well diggers came across some beautiful marble. Since the prince in charge of the region was building a new villa nearby, he was told of the discovery. No one knew that the marble was part of the theater or that it was situated in the ancient town of Herculaneum. Instead, the prince ordered an excavation, hoping to find even more marble for his house. Seven years later, when the prince's opulent villa was completed, he ordered workers to stop digging. During that time, they had stripped the theater of its statues and marble facade, without even knowing what they had found. In 1738, after the Bourbon King Charles III took control of the region, he was eager to find more bird treasures from the same site, so he hired a Spanish military engineer named Alcubierre. In short order, Alcubierre widened the entrance to the site, quickly discovered that the treasury was part of a theater. He also found an inscription that finally identified the location as Herculaneum, but in his haste to please Charles, Alcubierre essentially turned the site into a tunnel-filled coal mine. Some workers were hauling beautiful statues and other treasures out of the tunnels and sending them to the palace of Charles III. After 14 years, workers began to find fewer objects, but Alcubierre was not about to give up. Instead, he planned to try another site, the underground canal that had been attempted in the late 1500s. He hoped that it might lead to the ruins of Pompeii and further favor from Charles III. On March 30, 1748, a small crew of 24 men, 12 of them convicts, began work. Digging was easier at the canal site, but it was filled with areas of fire dam. That is, toxic gases trapped in the layers being excavated. 
Every time a pocket of fire damp was exposed, the diggers would have to run away to escape breathing the poisonous gas, and their work could be interrupted for many days. Twenty days later, the workers discovered something unexpected, the skeleton of a man who had died during the eruption. The excavation's report for that day read only, found a skeleton and 18 coins. Although this was the first recorded sign of the human tragedy at Pompeii, Alcubierre was more interested in the coins than the man. A few days later, another entry read, Nothing was found, and only ruined structures were uncovered. Eventually, he became so disappointed with the meager discoveries that he returned to the excavations at Herculium, leaving only a small crew to work at the canal site. No more than 50 men, some of them Algerian and Tunisian slaves, chained together in pairs, seemed to have been used at any time, even after the site was finally identified as Pompeii in 1763. But Pompeii was about to get much more attention. In 1771, excavators made a dramatic find, a large, luxurious house, now called the Villa of Diomedes, complete with two skeletons near the garden. These skeletons were of much greater interest, thanks to the riches found with them. Next to one man who held a key and wore a gold ring, was a hoard of coins wrapped in a cloth, 10 gold, 88 silver, and 9 bronze. This turned out to be one of the largest collections of money found at Pompeii, and certainly a dazzling find in 1771. The next year, as excavations of the house continued, Workers discovered 20 more skeletons, 18 adults and two children, piled together in a nearby underground room. The volcanic debris that had oozed into the room during the pyroclastic flows had hardened around the bodies and created imprints of the people, their clothing and even their hair. Excavators studied the impressions and conclude that they had found a family and its servants. The women with the house were beautifully woven clothing and was adorned with a great deal of jewelry, multiple necklaces, armbands, bracelets and rings. These early photo shows the villa of Diomedes after it was excavated. She carried a young boy in her arms. A young girl wearing golden jewelry accompanied her. As the fourth surge hit, she had covered her face with her clothing, gasping for breath. The rest of the victims were dressed quite differently. Most wore canvas or cloth socks that were more like leggings. Many had no shoes. The excavators conclude that they were slaves or servants. They also came to believe that the two skeletons found the previous year were the male head of the family, who carried the family's most valuable possessions in another slave. Word of this discovery and others travel around the world. Pompeii and its villa of Diomedes became part of the grand tour for healthy American and English travelers. As a result, many tourists flocked to the ruins, not only to watch the excavators, but also to see the skeletons. They would wander through the ruins to encounter Tableaux, that is, little scenes arranged by excavators, 
that future skeletons and objects found at the site. Two victims that fascinated early visitors to the site, according to the writer Jennifer Wallace, were found in the gladiators barracks in 1766. These two men, either prisoners or gladiators, were said to have still been in chocolates and chained to the wall when they died in the eruption. Excavators placed their skulls on shelves for all visitors to see. Unfortunately, some tourists stole bones from the skeletons and other artifacts as souvenirs, since the large site was poorly guarded. It is not surprising, therefore, that of all the coins and jewelry found at the Villa of Diomedes, only two items have been preserved to this day, a necklace and a gemstone. The rest have disappeared without a trace. Analyze the text. Main ideas and details. What is the central idea of pages 589? 593. What details does the author provide to support this idea?